Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Gowan. Um, I'm a well. I, I work for Drake Music. I'm here in that capacity. I'm their uh, head of R and D, research and development, and uh, I lead a department looking at uh, developing new musical instruments that are accessible to disabled musicians. And uh, over the next 40 minutes, I'm going to talk sort of about, I guess, the concepts that underpin that work, why I think it's important, um, and introduce you to some of the instruments that are already out there in the area of accessible music technology, which will hopefully underline why it's important that uh, people are developing new musical instruments. I think there's a real need for um, new accessible musical instruments uh, to be designed and for accessibility to be considered in the design of musical instruments that aren't necessarily going for a specific access market, but sort of just adaptability and the ability to make them, well, I guess adaptability is, is really key and important and needs to be considered. So um, our, our strap line is breaking down <laughs> disabling barriers to music and I've always found that quite helpful just in terms of getting my head around the concept of what we're trying to do um, because really disability is about, um, well it's a social problem which I'll talk about in a minute but it's about there being something about the design of, of the world or the tools we're using preventing you from achieving something, that's what's making you disabled. So, um, a little bit about us. We're a national organisation. We are based in London. We're around the corner. We're in Shoreditch. Um, we're actually quite small, but with quite a big reach. Um, there's about <coughs> four members of staff and about 20 of us who work as associates. Um, some based in London, some based in Manchester, some based in uh, Bristol, where we have offices, and then they're scattered all over the rest of the UK as well. But a lot of us are freelancers. Um, we have been for maybe 20, 25 years the leaders in music, disability and technology. Um, and uh, traditionally our work's been centred around education, so going into schools, uh, working in uh, schools with disabled children, um, also professional development, so working with music teachers and teachers in those schools to introduce them to music technology normally as a means to make music making accessible to a child. Um, but also we often find that quite expensive instruments are, are being left in cupboards because of a lack of knowledge or confidence in using them. So we'll often do CPD, uh, continuous professional development in that way. We have a small artistic development programme, so working with um, disabled musicians to support the development of their work as <coughs> artists. And then I look after what is now known as DM Lab, which is the research and development side of things, which some of you um, come to. So yeah, and maybe hopefully some more of you might as well. We have a monthly meeting and we're uh, collaborating with um, the Centre for Digital Music next week on a hackathon on Saturday, so, uh, Saturday the 6th. So uh, I haven't put a link in this presentation, but I'll, I'll sort that out and make sure you know about it. We'll send it around, yeah. We'll send it around, definitely. So I thought before I go into the technology, it would be useful just to touch on the social model of dis disability, because this is the thing that I think underpins good design when it comes to working with disabled people generally have disabled musicians. So um, this is all of the scope website, so it's just, I'm just taking it straight from there because I think they, just, they talk about it really well. Um, the social model of disability says that disability is caused by the way society is organised rather than by a person's impairment or difference. And it looks at ways of removing barriers that restrict life choices for disabled people. And when barriers are removed, disabled people can be independent and equal in society with choice and control over their own lives. So, it's very self-evident when it comes to wheelchair access that uh, a ramp makes a set of stairs, um, well, a ramp makes a separate floor accessible where stairs don't if you're a wheelchair user. It's much less evident when it comes to the way you might interact with someone on the autistic spectrum or uh, a different physical impairment or, or, or another hidden impairment. Um, when it comes to musical instruments, it's very much true that it's the instruments themselves that are preventing people. Not, not their impairments. I think this is important because this social model I think is very empowering for disabled people as a community. It, it's, uh, it, it's been developed because beforehand people looked at disability as a medical problem and, and, and I guess that becomes something you have to own yourself. Is my impairment defines who I am. I have to own my physical disability or my um, learning disability, and that, that is something that I have to deal with. And actually, the social model says no, actually, if society is better organised, uh, 
I can have a better life. And I think it's, it's a really important thing in that way. And an impairment, as you know, is, is a long-term limitation of a person's physical, mental, sensory function. And this is a very good video I'm going to show now. Any sound? No. With a problem. I've been learning about this yes, it's so on me. Look at this ability to be different. I myself were able to be able to gain some confidence. Come on, I'm sorry. Um, Self-esteem. Social model basically says we are people with impairments and those impairments clearly have an impact on how we live our lives. But the impairments are not the things which disable us. I'm disabled by the world around me, and if the world was more accessible, I would be less disabled, and then I would just be left with my impairment, i.e. what doesn't work. It's not that my legs don't work that's disabling me, it's the fact that if I want to, you know, you know if I'm on a flat surface, I can wheel around fine, I'm wonderfully happy. It's only when I come up to a flight of stairs. As a wheelchair user, you have a slightly easier job of explaining the social model. Whereas if you're trying to explain the less physical barriers, it's much harder. There's barriers <laughs> everywhere in life to do with how we communicate, uh, to do with people's attitudes. Discovering the social model actually was a massive liberation on another level. Yeah, I was being treated differently, and no, it wasn't me being deficient, it was everybody else's social anxieties that were being projected onto me. The blame for you not fitting in is no longer on your shoulders. Suddenly my disability is out there and not in here. It was what made me realise uh, that I was something beyond the thing that other people thought I was. It's a real liberating thing, but it also means you can change it. We can say to the world, look, you must put a lift in this building, you must make sure that the signage is readable for people with visual impairment. If you want that equality to be real, you've really got to then tackle the inequality people are experiencing in schools, in workplaces, with transport. The main reason that the social model I think is important to disabled people is that it allows us to be a community. You achieve a whole lot more as a group. As long as we as disabled people make sure that our voices are heard and that all those people that support us also have their voices heard, I think, I think we will get there. I hope that SCOPE is doing work that will help disabled people to become prouder of who we are, pushing boundaries around who can be included and where. Come the glorious day, if ever came, where, where, where all the barriers went, you know, we, we'd just be people with impairment. We, we wouldn't be disabled people uh, anymore. Find out more about Scope's work and how to get involved by clicking below to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So, um... Yeah, I find that, I mean, that, for me, that's been the underpinning. Learning that and understanding about the social model has really helped me to understand how to design and, and work with accessible music technology. I mean, our role at Direct Music really is to try and link to social musicians and other professionals. And so we're not necessarily the experts when it comes to the designing, or in fact, we're just not the experts when it comes to the designing or the making of new things. And we don't aspire to be that, and we're not... Um, we're not looking to be manufacturers or, uh, or we need to own anything actually at all. What we're looking to do is to hook people up and create situations where we can support a relationship between makers and between disabled musicians and, and create an environment where new to encourage people, I guess, like you, to um, to make new things that will be of use to the community of disabled musicians. So that's what our, our role there is. Um, and I say that because it's true, but also just sort of. Uh, because we, we have no kind of intellectual property kind of thing with what we do at all. It's purely, we're a charity, we're there to support people in making accessible music instruments. We don't want to own it, we don't want to sell it, we don't want anything to do with that going forward. What have I done here? <laughs> I think I wrote this page years ago. Wow. I might not do that page. <laughs> I did. This is just a, a very nice vision on overcoming barriers to disabled uh, disability. So when, when Drake Music started about 30 years ago, um, the way music was taught in schools was quite patronising, and, and the amount of tools available for music making was basically 
holding people's hands with percussion instruments, move them for them. It was very little available. Um, drone music started really, I guess, at the advent of, of um, MIDI technology um, in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. Well, not the advent of MIDI technology, but sort of widely available using keyboards and stuff like the sound beam. Um, and now we've got about six tools that are widely used, um, and you find them in schools around. Um, the sound beam is the, the, grand, the granddaddy of this. I don't know, has anyone used a, a sound beam in this room? A couple, yeah, one. Okay, well, the sound beam is basically it's, it's an ultrasound, ultrasonic uh, detector. This box here, this is the new one. They're about £4,000, maybe £4,500. This box here, you plug... Um, the sensor into, and uh, it's basically a, a MIDI controller. That's effectively what it is. The newer version, this one, also has a built-in sound engine. You've got some switches you can plug in. Uh, you can plug a microphone in. Um, and effectively, all you do is you hold your hand in front of it, move it back and forward, or your leg, or your head, or, or any limb, and uh, you can make sound. Uh, what's great about it is it's extremely durable. Um, they, I've got one myself. It's about 15 years old. It's like a you know road-worn Fender amp. It's, it, really does take a beating. It always works, it's very reliable, I know what it does. Um, but it, it's also a very limited instrument. It's sort of great for first access, for the first time you come across a child in a school um, and need to do something accessible, it, it works very well. But it, it, if you want to do anything really expressive or develop a, a long-term musical practice, I think it, there's a, an awful lot of design problems with it because literally you have a scale that goes back and forward as you hold um, your hand, and you can have a scale, you can have an arpeggio, you can have chords, um, and obviously it being MIDI, you can then do stuff within the computer to interpret that and do more complicated things, but it's, it's a very limited thing. Um, that's one of the, the main things that's out there at the moment, and that's the main thing that's been used for 20 years, the, the sound beam. That you still find it everywhere. Um, it's basically unchanged in that time. And what's that one's the Skoog, which is quite quite a nice looking design. Um, it's effectively a, a touch sensitive and after touch sensitive controller. It's quite squishy. It's USB links to a computer. Um, it's got custom software. It costs about 300 quid now. It used to be about 700 pounds. Uh, people have mixed experiences. I've, I've personally just found it to be quite unreliable. That's not... Um, other people might have had different experiences, but every time I've used it, I've, I've found it sort of let me down, um, which is, I don't tend to use it so much anymore. Um, iPads have been one of the most significant mainstream additions to the sector. Um, uh, quite, almost like a surprise left field entry into accessible music uh, music making because they're um, they're not designed for it at all and they're completely accidentally accessible. They've got quite good accessible features within them for um, for some impairments, not for all impairments, but um, for some people they, they work really well. And apps like GarageBand and ThumbJam we've found to work actually quite well. Um, they've got the added advantage of being about £300 each rather than 4000 and you can carry five or six in your rucksack, which makes a difference. Good battery life, things like that are making a big difference. I think the biggest deal with an iPad is that if it is accessible for you, um, particularly working with children, is it's a, it's a product that everyone wants anyway. So you're suddenly, there's no sort of social stigma, there's no kind of sense of it being a product designed specifically for people who can't access mainstream instruments. And I think that's that's really important, actually, in terms of what it says to a child, particularly if you're working in a mixed setting, um, about the tools they're using. Um, Apollo Ensemble, I guess, is effectively a um, Max MSP symbol. It's, it allows you to get sensors and stuff and hook them up to sound and uh, images and things. PC only. Um, it's a good system. I couldn't find out how much it costs at the moment. It's a few hundred quid, I think. And beams you might have come across. It's basically a laser heart um, of, of types. Oh, and chorus. This one's quite good. You can roll over this with a wheelchair. It's really strong. Um, you can, these are like jigsaw puzzles. And these are all the things I find in schools. I work in schools every week normally in this setting. And I find a mixture of these different things out there. Um, it's got LEDs built in that one. Yeah, it's a good one. So the question, I guess, three years ago when I started this program, um, and Becky was actually at one of my first events I did, uh, was could we do better than this? You know, if we have... A, a, a market that's dominated by technology that's 20, 25 years old and then you've got these little things around the periphery is, is there a possibility we can do better? And I think the answer is, is definitely yes. Um, these sound beams, these scoops are great for sort of sound making 
And if you're doing a five-week project in a school, they're kind of enough. If the child's, if nobody's bothered to make music with a child up to that point, and I think it is about bothering. I think it's about being patient and spending the time to really be with the child and, and work out what their access barriers are. But if nobody's bothered to do that yet, a scoob or a sound beam is great. You can go from no sound making to sound making. But actually, if you, you know, if we're talking about a fourteen-year-old child, well. There's no reason to believe they're any different in their aspirations to any other 14-year-old child. And you know, certainly when I was 14, I wanted to be Jimi Hendrix. Um, there were a number of problems with that. Um, I played guitar right-handed for a start. But if you've got any desire to be a virtuoso in a, an instrument, you want to start in a process that's going to lead to you still learning stuff 30 years down the road. You want to be doing a, a practice that's still sustaining you creatively. The way I guess that a, a pencil and a pen does as a, as a sketch artist, or playing the cello does, um, if you play the cello, and I, and, I, and I think these instruments have a real problem there. So I think it's an interesting time. It's a, I've never seen more musical instruments being developed than there are at the moment with um, organised uh, university departments like yourselves, the hack space, the, the amount of membership to hack space, music hack space. Um, and the amount of people I see bringing stuff up on YouTube, new things being developed. Um, but I don't think enough attention is being given to accessible design. Um, so we want to inspire and support change and really link disabled musicians up to makers and to designers and to students. And that's what we've been doing over the last few years. And I think this is the key thing. There's been this idea coming out of some manufacturers, commercial manufacturers, that they have designed the accessible musical instrument. And that's something I, I think that's asking the wrong question, actually. I think the thing about accessibility is that, firstly, everyone's impairment's different. Um, so I think it's, it, it's irrational to state that you've invented a product that's going to solve everyone's access needs. I don't, I don't think that's, I think it's enormously patronising, but I don't think it's also thinking about it very clearly. Um, I think the other problem is that is about choice, about musical choice. Um, what we decide to do musically as, as individuals, I think, says a lot about what we like, but also about who we want to be. And if you decide to play Baroque for a uh, recorder, for example, well, that's, that's because you like Baroque music. But it might also be because, because you want to be part of the Baroque crowd and you want to be in that group and it says something about you socially and, um, and everything goes with it. The same if you want to play punk or if you want to be dubstep, I and mean, all these things are, are very loaded social things, and if we're just inventing an instrument with, with a way of playing it, then, then effectively you're putting people into one area musically, so I think there needs to be a, a broader range of accessible instruments as possible, A for accessibility, but also for choice, um, to allow people to do what they want. I do believe the sector's massively complacent, or certainly it was three years ago when we set up, um, there's... I think there's a lot more stuff happening now, but the people who are making the mainstream instruments, I think there's a sense of complacency there. The market, the marketplace is well. Out of all those instruments I showed you, two are two are really dominating all the all the schools in the country. So that I think there's a lot of complacency there. So I think it's a massive opportunity for anyone who, who wants to design in this area. Um, from my point of view, I think it's just necessary. I think there needs to be more thought going into this instrument design. This is um, John Kelly. He did this video real close to Blades with Nesta. He did this video to support that. Maybe he's performing at the Oaks. There's massive gaps in terms of music technology um, and accessibility. I think. Um, you know, uh, a lot of music apps are great for things like improvisation or for, for playing around with. But for a serious musician, uh, particularly a musician like myself who's got access requirements, um, things just aren't really going far enough. And I really hope this project, uh, both in terms of our learning and in terms of our outcome, will take music technology a little bit further uh, in terms of um, access and also, also in terms of performance, you know, being able to have applications and music technology that can work on a professional level. So what am I looking for in terms of a piece of kit? Well, I'm looking for something that is uh, reliable. I'm looking for something that's easy for me to use and to set up, that doesn't need too many 
two and three finger press functions, you know, that kind of stuff. It needs to be accessible, so it works on sticky fingers and all that kind of stuff. And that has accessibility intuitively designed into it. And I need something that's going to give me precision to um, be able to perform up to the level that I want to um, with the dynamics that, that any other artist or musician want. And um, I want to be able to do that with my little movements down here, like that. Um, and hopefully, I want to, we want to be able to design something that doesn't just work for me, but works for disabled people with lots of different access requirements. Uh, what I'm really saying is that access is going to be intrinsic to the design of the technology, but that it will be mainstream. Hopefully, we're going to develop uh, a tool that will be not only mainstream, but it will be completely thought through in terms of access. It's not a bolt-on, it's not something just for disabled people, but uh, the features of access makes the instrument a lot better um, for all-round general use. And I think that's what we're aiming at. We're aiming at an instrument that works well for both disabled people and non-disabled people alike. So we uh, really want to up the game in terms of accessible music technology, technology and accessible instrumentation. I'm really, really excited about it as an artist because I desperately need uh, instruments that can uh, meet up to the game of my imagination and the drive to perform. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share this little video. I'm really sorry I can't be with you, uh, but I'm very excited about the whole project and just hope we've got an opportunity to uh, break new ground and really try and create something new, intuitive and exciting that will wow people. So uh, let's have it. Cheers. So John, uh, that was him performing at the Paralympic Open Circle at the beginning. He's recently toured in Mexico. He's, you know, he's a professional musician, and I work with John a lot. Um, and I mean, perhaps an example of what we're talking about is he was really interested in able to push. Um, I got a push controller, and we were all playing around with it. And at the time, I wasn't that into it myself. And I was like, I can have a look. And um, straight away for, him, for for John, he was just like, well, the fact that I can't remap this key, these keys, is, just means I can't use it. There's no reason at all that the physical layout of this controller should be accessible to me if I was able to, say, have a modifier key at the front and put the things in the top right down in the bottom left. Like you can actually on an iPad or an iPhone where you can control things from a small movement. And it wouldn't have taken an awful lot of thought to have had a, a, an, a, an accessibility function built into the, the push controller. It wouldn't have changed the design. It would have just been a software thing. Um, and you could have just had it there, a little switch, if you hold these three keys down or whatever, you go into access mode and then you can remap stuff. So we're having the same right now with the um, Launchpad Excel, which is thinking about using as a mixer, but not quite sure if the, the fader reach is, is good for him. You know? So it's, um, I think it's a, a good example there um, of how just sort of, I think, I think people just aren't, aren't considering it. You know, something like Ableton Push. Nobody, nobody in the team developing Ableton Push is thinking there will be a group of people out there who will want, who will need a different feature layout to what comes to standard. I mean, this is kind of obvious, really. I mean, you're all instrument designers, so you know this. I mean, the, the AMT is accessible musical technology, but it's, it's about the need the access need, it's about the how we do it, but the, I mean, me and Andrew talked about saying, well, the really key thing is the usability, the ergonomics, the playability, that's, that's the thing that I think is, is lacking in the commercially available products right now. Sound beams kind of like a, so you can make a sound with a gesture. The problem solved, we will now sell them to you for lots of money. Um, and, and I love sound beam. I mean, I use it all the time, but it's not, it's not an elegant solution necessary to the problem. And the same with perhaps scoot and stuff, or switches, we use switches a lot. Um, so I think this is, this is the area that, that I'm really interested in seeing developed, is the kind of the development of ergonomic instruments that really make expressive sound possible. And we join the dots, I think I've said that enough earlier on. This is a really interesting example of the kind of thing. And you might have come across Peter Dearman and his uh, Syro Power Engine, and you probably already know this, but I love the idea that someone else has taken this idea and decided to use it to... Um, store energy by renewable, uh, power by renewable forms. And, and I think there's things out there that I'm interested in, and I, I suppose the Better Platform's an example of that, where a 
I've come across something, I'm just like, that will be amazing for accessible user technologies. That hasn't been developed with that in mind at all. Um, that would be amazing. Uh, and another example is Touch OSC, which is, you know, as you know, has just been there as an Ableton controller, well, as an OSC controller, rather. And um, Charlotte White, who's a disabled musician we've worked with for years, um, has come along and she's designed, she's now able to design her own accessible music technology using something like Touch OSC, which for her, works well. And this idea of being in control of your own access, I think, is really powerful. Um, and I know that's the sort of thing that you were talking about, Fiore, with your Access BD idea, the idea of people being in control of their own tools. I think that's an amazingly powerful idea that, if possible, we should be able to design our own accessible interfaces through, through good design. This is entirely unnecessary. PowerPoint has a sort of linear problem, doesn't it? That you kind of you sit earlier on and decide which way you're going to do things. It's a bit early on. Um, what we look at do at Direct Music is join the dots. We look to share what's happening. I mean, it's really about open source and open source attitude for sharing what's going on. That's what we're trying to do. Um, the idea is to inspire people, I guess, beyond our, our immediate environment, but to give, uh, uh, I guess, an international viewpoint on what's possible and how good things work. And this is how and this is how we work at the moment. We have these monthly meetings and I think I've explained all this all, all already. This is the, the stuff I wanted to get to. This the stuff we've been supporting. So over the three years we've been um, we've been working with a series of makers and they've come really from different communities. So we've had people from whom it's a hobby, so I guess the hacker community. Um, we've had people um, like yourselves, who are, well, like some of you, who are, who are students or researchers who have come to me, often with their college projects, and said, look, I want to work with a, an accessible music instrument. Um, and we've done some work with companies as well. And the, the winner of our first hackathon was um, Diogo Moroda, who designed this breath pad instrument, which didn't, unfortunately, go too far. But that's turned into a, um, a sound beam replacement, which I think is quite, potentially quite important. Um, and off, the picture there is of the Mark, that's the Mark I prototype, which cost £10 in components. Um, and this is the Mark II here. And uh, what's brilliant about it is, I don't know what the retail will be, I don't know if it will even, even bring it out to retail, but it will be you know, under a couple of hundred quid, hopefully under £100. And you've got, I'll give that tool, but you've got basically the same functionality as a sound bit. What's brilliant about it, using it in class is that you can pass this around and kids can hold this themselves. So the way we're using it is completely different. Working in London, the fact I can carry 10 of these quite easily, that makes a big difference. Um, it's got built-in MIDI out, so I can still do the things I would do with a sound beam. I can still get a better sound quality if I want to, or, or a better use through a max patch or similar and, and do something completely different. Um, so yeah, he just turned up with this one day. Um, and for a community like us of educators working with disabled children, this is, this is an absolutely massive game changer um, because it can go places the sound beam can't, it weighs nothing. I mean, that includes the battery in there, so pass that around. It's got a few design problems. He's not a, he's not a brilliant collaborator. Um, he didn't come back to us during the design process. He just delivered me 10. Um, so it starts in the, in the key of G sharp, which is a, an interesting design choice for working in schools. Um, <laughs> Which means every time, and it, it forgets its settings every time you switch it off. So every time you switch it on, you have to set it, to sort of press the button. You have to remember what colour the LED has to be to be in that memory, and then you have to press a button five times. It's very unintuitive. Um, but basically, he's got it right on the whole. It's, it's a very, very useful thing, because uh, that gesture control thing is important. But also, if you think about peripatetic teaching of instruments, well, if the sound beam is the right thing for a child, we can send that home to a child in a way you couldn't send a sound beam home, eh? because they're expensive, but also they're difficult to set up and they're difficult to use. That has a built-in speaker, okay, it's tiny, but it's enough for a child to practice on their own, and it's, and it's easy enough for their parents to switch on and use. So just suddenly that's opening a whole load of things that, that is normally charted. Um, I'd be very interested to see if anyone can design something similar using a better program. Platform. This is John's guitar, the Kelly Caster. So this is an example of what I call artist-led. So the, the other ones, kind of, I guess, 
that kind of came from me. I, I've always said the sound beam's great, we need a better version. You know, and, and I'll keep saying that. Because it is kind of great, but we do need a better version. This was John himself came to me and said, Gowan, look, I've always wanted to be a guitarist. You know, I've always wanted to be a guitarist. I can't, in my impairment such, I can't play a, a guitar, a normal guitar in, in the normal way. And I, he's tried all sorts of things, but he's like, look, is there a way we can design a guitar? And so he came up with this extensive PowerPoint display of, of what he wanted in the guitar. And we took it to the monthly happenings. You know, some of you might even have been there. And um, we decided just to have a go. And the last hackathon we, we did, we, this is what we had. We had this. And um, it's basically got a piezo pickup on, on each string that you'd use for a, um, they used for a, a MIDI system. I think that's what they're for. Uh, and then we've not, at this stage, we've not done anything sophisticated, we've just run them into a little circuit board that I've put 3.5mm jacks on just so you can stick them into my priest, just so we could get on with the code. And then Charles here has done a max patch, um, and each string is being tracked for amplitude. And then the max patch, uh, I think it just feeds a, a, a soft synth, I think, doing the guitar synthesis at this point. Uh, and in, in a couple of days, we managed to, you know, with these guys, I did the hardware, those guys did everything else, and they managed to hack something together that was, I mean, it was massively emotional. It, it worked, and this is the thing, because he uses the iPad, well the iPhone garage band app to play guitar, and this is a really weird thing, because like that, that, I don't know if you've seen that app, it's, it's kind of okay, but until you see someone like John using it as his guitar, you kind of realise the power of it in that context, it's like it stops being a toy and it becomes something that allows him to be a singer-songwriter, and he does, he does some gigs with it. He was like, well, why can't I have that chord system on an actual guitar? That was the concept. I want that garage band thing where I can select my chords on a touch sensitive keyboard using my left hand, sort of down here, and strum with my right hand on an actual guitar and have the feel and um, the feel of the guitar. Uh, and that's what they managed to do. I think you can see he's holding the iPad uh, or the iPhone down there. I think it's probably just whatever. Is it Mirror, the Max MSP iPad thing? Something like that, isn't it? They've done it in that at the moment. Um, and yeah, I mean, all of us were sort of on the verge of tears when that came out, because it's just allowing someone to do something they wanted to do all their life, which is play guitar. This is a great one. Um, it's, it, it's a speaker in a folder. That's <laughs> all it is. My mate Dave's done this one. And um, his name's Dave Darch, which is why it's called the Darch Resonator. Um, vibration feedback, you know, haptic feedback is really important. Um, and working with very young children um, with profound impairments, it, it, teaching them about cause and effect can be the first thing that you have to do on their route to becoming musicians. And so the fact that they vibrates when they're playing particularly an iPad, which is quite an abstract sort of surface, that's really important so they know their music making and that the sound's close to them. And all he's done is get an X-Mini speaker and stuck it inside a lever right for it. But actually it works quite well. It's about 15 quid to make one, and anyone can make that. And that, that's been really quite useful in schools, because a lot of the schools we work in, they're not technical, they're scared of technology, they might even be scared of music teaching, um, but they can all put together something like that and that will help. So that's, that, that's been a, a surprise success. Um, we're Mimi Gloves collaborators and you probably all know about the Mimi Gloves and you may have a range of opinions about them. The thing about the Mimi Gloves is that for this guy Chris, he's another artist who came to me and he was like, Gary, look, I've got cerebral palsy. I'm a guitarist and a pianist. Um, he's a professional guitarist and pianist and, and producer. That's what he does. My impairment's getting to the extent now that I'm losing the ability to play guitar and play piano. It's becoming a problem. I'm having to drop songs from my set list because I'm not able to play them. So, you know, is there something in what you guys are doing at Great Music that could help me? Is there some, something we can look into? And at the same time, I was talking to the Mimi team about how could we work together. Actually, it was that Nesta project didn't get funding for um, it, was originally what we were going to do, and it just it seemed to fit, uh, and it's actually, that wasn't an intentional pun, um, it seems to fit, and, it, and it's fitted really well, he's done really well um, for him, and he's been using them maybe for 14 months now, and he's actually playing this Sunday at the um, Half Moon in Putney with Imogen Heap, um, on a tour funded by the Arts Council and uh, PRS Foundation. And he spent, you know, a year really deeply learning these gloves. And actually, for him, the fact that the very thing that I probably saw as a design problem in the first place, which is their enormous adapted, 
adaptability, the fact you have to spend so long training them and setting up things before you can even start playing, is exactly the thing that makes them brilliant for Chris. Because they're learning his hands. And whatever his, his reach is right now, he can work with. And if his condition changes again, and his impairment changes again, he will still not be disabled because he can retrain the job, retrain the class. So it's just a, it's been an enormously powerful thing. And they're incredibly expressive if you put that amount of time in. I'm starting to think of them as being analogous to playing the, sort of the violin or something. They sort of take a long time to make a nice sound, but once, you, once you're getting into them a few months down the road, you can do some great things. Um, this is a thing called the Kazumi. It's come out of a student we uh, support. He was a design student, um, and he wanted to design a, a, an instrument. So it's, uh, it's just a, it's a touch board, a uh, Raspberry Pi, on a PD, this is uh, underneath this fabric is some uh, copper tape, and then you turn it to change the scales. It's quite a nice little thing. He's currently he's got a bella. He's currently putting it on that at the moment. That's his next project. Um, this one's fun. This is literally a Tupperware with a touch board in it and uh, some Neo pixels that I I hacked together, and I've put it in here because it's an example of how the surpri most surprising things can happen when you're working in context. So I was in a school testing stuff out. And we had a lot of these instruments, and none of them were right, really. And um, so I put this together, and actually it was, it was a massive hit with two or three of the kids, just um, just capacitive touch with visual and haptic feedback. That, that was the thing. They're four years old. Um, oh, so. school, I mean, with this amazing teacher called Gareth, uh, Gareth Smith, who's a, he's a brilliant musician and, and a really engaged and thoughtful practitioner in this setting. He knows his kids really well, and he, he said, particularly with another child, Isabel, he's like, I've never seen her so engaged. You know, I've never seen her so engaged in a class until she had this, I mean, it's literally a sports direct tuck away with some stuff in it. Um, and it's amazing, sort of, how profound effect these things can have, not just on their musicality, but actually on, on a child's development generally um, in the school. <coughs> Moving on from that, so this, this particular teacher was quite demanding. He kept asking me to design new things. So he said, well, can we put something in an actual music, musical instrument? So I put it in a frame drum, you know, like a tambourine without the, the, the jingles. And uh, this time he wanted it wireless to a computer. The, the latency is horrible on this thing. So, um, that's because my code's not that good again. Um, someone helped me yesterday, so it's going to be better. Um, it's Again, I mean, the, the feedback we've had from that, both in the class, the engagement from the children, but also from the teachers, is, I, mean, I think it's had a profound impact, well, I know it's had a profound impact on, on their musicality, but also we're just trying to develop here a set of, we're kind of calling the cause and effect machines that will take a child from knowing that they're making, in this class, it's only 
only accessible to this group of children. It's not necessarily going to be right for everyone. But for this class, take them from knowing they're making a sound, so conscious sound making, and then maybe then onto this, developing some musical skills, and playing it with or without the Bluetooth link, um, and then maybe then progressing onto other things as well. And James is great. I mean, this is an example of completely... James again came to me. There's a theme here. Great, great disabled musicians coming to me to solve their problems, which is brilliant. Um, James is a conductor, and uh, he, he came to me because he wanted a more elegant head-mounted head conducting baton. Um, and literally, uh, literally, I glued a baton to his uh, glasses, pretty much. There's a... There's a um, you know the connector blocks used for mains electricity? The, um, you know, join two wires together. That's, this, this bit here is just a big one of those um, that I then fix the conductor's baton quite well. Um, and so I just literally super glue that on. So the next stage will be to, to uh, 3D print something more elegant than that even. But before that, he had, he had a almost like a helmet mounted um, baton. And I guess it's about stability, but it was also about bringing the way his baton looked more into line with uh, normal attire. You know, so that it, it worked, but also it was elegant. And he's just due funding to do a week-long program at the Royal Academy of Music, developing his conducting with the uh, teacher of conducting there. So it's brilliant. Photosynth's an interesting little thing. These are all all stuff we've come out the last few years in our program. <coughs> this is a, a web-based, um, I think it's in JavaScript. It's a web-based app. Um, something I'm really excited about the concept. It doesn't quite work properly yet, in, in my experience. I need to sit down with Zen and talk about this, but the idea that you could just dial in a website and there would be an instrument that used the webcam, I think that idea is really powerful. Um, and this is an example of it, because it doesn't require anything. Um, and particularly if you've ever worked in schools, um, you'll know how difficult it is to get the IT department to support anything we're doing and to even install any software. You know, it can be a complete nightmare. So the, the idea that there might be something that you just go, well, if you go here, there's something. It would be amazing if anyone wanted to take on a challenge like that. And of course, the Bella platform that you guys here are developing is just amazing. And uh, we've not done anything with it yet. We're going to use it next week at this hackathon. But as I said earlier on, this is a great example of someone else putting an awful lot of time and energy into something to solve a different problem. And then I become aware of it. And I'm just like, well, can't see any reason why we won't be using this to prototype at least half of the accessible instruments we make in the future, because it just makes sense. And it's back to that idea of, I hope that Drake Music were able to bring you a new context to technology that's already out there. Um, another thing we're doing is just normal physical computing stuff, I guess. Just the normal sort of hacky, fun stuff has an enormous value in the classroom, actually. It's a makey-makey, particularly it's been brilliant working with children in an accessible context. Um, they're making their wheelchairs, you know, touch sensitive. Um, and it's brilliant, of course, because it's, it's easy enough for almost anyone to get their head around if you use it with sound plug or something straightforward like that. Um, touch board's also brilliant for different reasons, or similar and different reasons. We've used Connect as well, obviously. Um, games controllers can be good because there's all that design that's gone into the haptic feedbacks and the ergonomics. Sometimes that's brilliant, depends who you're working with. And back to the, the feedback thing, um, just hooking up DMX lights um, to sound beams and stuff can really help. Um, so little simple things like that, of just having a light feedback so that when the noise is playing, um, you've got some, something other than the sound itself, which is quite abstract. I was just coming to the wrong point. This is another thing we developed. Um, another student who was doing an engineering degree came to us with an idea. You know the Leap Motion interface? You've come across that? Um, I was so excited when that came out. I thought this was it. I thought, brilliant, we have a, a mainstream motion detecting thing that's going to solve an awful lot of our problems. The price is right, it looks cool, we can put it in my pocket. And actually, initially, at least, as an accessibility aid for music making, it was rubbish, because the first thing it wanted to see was, was your hand. <coughs> so it made a massive... In the, in the quest for um, ergonomics and... Uh, intuitive use. <coughs> they just made massive assumptions about your physicality. So, so they wanted to see a hand like this, I guess, and they wanted you to hold your hand like this, and you could move it in a certain place. And you couldn't, you couldn't adapt that at all. There was no way of doing it. So, Kieran spent an awful lot of time working on this, and we now have software that will track a baton 
or a single finger, or, or even just you know just anything, um, and play music with it. So that's a, that's, a, that's a great leap forward, I guess. So yeah, I think there's a clear and present need for accessible musical instruments. I think they should be. I think accessibility should be considered in everything. Really. I don't think there's any uh, reason not to. And um, if anyone wants any assistance in this area, and that's what we're here for at Drake Music. We're committed to, to supporting people. We meet monthly for that reason, but I can also find time outside of that, um, whether just for advice or um, to hook you up with musicians or testing in different environments. That's what we're there for. So yeah, I guess any questions? Maybe we should put the lights on. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs>